is Act of Worship, your source for commentary and discussion on worship, theology, and culture. I'm your host, Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones. Hello and welcome to the Act of Worship podcast. And here we are today, one-fifth of the way through the Psalm Project, looking at Psalm 30. And so I'm very excited, very thrilled about this one. Uh, Psalm 30, this title, it's a Psalm of David, a song at the dedication of the temple. This title um, indicates that the Psalm was written for the dedication of the temple. And in David's time, the temple had not yet been built. If you remember, that became the responsibility of his son Solomon. But he could have prepared for its dedication much as he prepared for the building of it by gathering supplies. And you see this account in 1 Chronicles 22. So David certainly did prepare for the building of it, even though he knew he would not see it built. A greater difficulty here is the lack of any mention of of the temple in the body of the psalm. Okay? But it likely was used at the dedication of the temple. And so again, many of these psalms have liturgical purposes in their original intent, and we can use that use them for the same purposes today. And so attempts to link this psalm with the plague that is recorded in 1 Chronicles 21... Uh, fail to take into account that David himself was not afflicted. So many scholars will try to link this psalm. Uh, if you read First Chronicles uh, 21, there is an account of a plague. A lot of people try to link it to that, but it does not mention that David was um, that David himself was not afflicted. And so there's some issues there. Nevertheless. It has been titled as, and, and most often thought of, as a psalm that was used at the dedication of the temple. So that is what we're going to go with. That's what I think. And so here we are. Let's look at it. Psalm 30. Beginning in verse 1. Psalm 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. O oh Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. But your favor, O oh Lord... By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong, hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. So David begins here. He says, I'll extol you for you have drawn me up. The Hebrew verb is used of drawing a bucket out of a well. An appropriate portrayal, I think, of, of saving someone from Sheol, the grave, which is often pictured as a wet and a muddy pit. In verse 2, O Lord my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. And this is an indication that the psalm is a thanksgiving in response to physical healing. Again, we go back to that account in 1 Chronicles 21. And so I, I don't think this should be linked to that. Verse 3. You've brought me up from shield. You've restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. You brought my soul from shield. 
the in Genesis 2:7 uh, it says, then the Lord God formed the man out of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. This is the idea that we are more than just a body. We're more than just flesh and bones, but we have a soul. We are eternal beings. Whether you realize it or not, you are an eternal being. And so David's saying here, you've brought my soul up, not just my body, but you have spiritually healed me. God made humanity, body and soul, male and female. And so David realizes that. He understands it. Then in verse 4, he says, sing praises to the Lord, O you, his saints. The word here, saints is related to a covenant loving kindness and, sp and specifies those in covenant with a relationship God. God is a relational God. He has made a covenant with his people. And so this is referencing his people. Verse 5, your anger is but for a moment. God's mercy is sure. It is tried. It is true. It is certain. Romans 8.18, 8, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth com uh, comparing with the glory that is to be revealed for us. 2 Corinthians 4.17, For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. God's anger is for a moment, but his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. In other words, this is just temporary. These difficulties, these trials are temporary. In verse 7, you made my mountains stand strong. Mountains, as opposed to the sea, are a symbol of stability and strength and often represent security inside the protection of God. And then we've seen a similar phrase to this before in the Psalms in verse 9, what profit is there in my death? Will the dust praise you. So the psalmist here, David, he begins with God for his life. When he says, I extol you, I'll extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up. You've not let my foes rejoice over me. So he, he, he begins here and what he does is he makes a bargain with God for his life. Okay. <laughs> He's trying to say, God, what good is it if, if I die? I mean, and so what he does is he points out that God would gain a voice of praise if he healed him. So David's going through some sort of physical ailment here. And he says, what good is it if you don't heal me? So he's trying to make a bargain here. And this is not a developed treatment of the afterlife, okay? this The point is that death would bring a conclusion to David's desire to glorify God in this world. In other words, he has a purpose here. What good is it if I die? You see situations in scripture where people bargain with God. I've always found that to be interesting. Should we bargain? Should we try to make a deal, if you will, with God? I've always kind of thought maybe we shouldn't do that. But you see this going on in scripture. God is a God who we can be honest with God. You know, he might say no. He might not give us the response we want, but we can be honest with God. In fact, you look at the story of Jonah and Nineveh. This is one reason I tell people, even as a Calvinist, as someone who believes in the complete sovereignty of God, they say, what's the point of praying? Well, look at the story of Jonah, Nineveh. Jonah went and preached to Nineveh, and they repented, and God relented on his plans to destroy them. And so it does make a difference to pray. Yes, God is totally in control. But can he not totally be in control and change his mind, if you will? Although there's there are several arguments that would say he truly didn't change his mind. <laughs> the point is, God is sovereign, but we are his people in covenant relationship with him. We can be honest with him. We can talk to him. We can tell him what's going on in our minds and our hearts and, and if you will, Tried to make some sort of bargain, as David does here. 
That's not to say, and, and I, I joke about this. Sometimes we, we tend to think, you know, we're watching our favorite sports team. God, if they win this game, I promise I will do such and such. That's not what I'm talking about. God doesn't need to be reminded of anything. He knows everything. But in our pleas to him, something is triggered in that covenant relationship. In Exodus 2, it says that God heard the cries of his people, the, the Israelites, the Hebrews. He heard the cries of his people and he remembered his covenant and he acted. In other words, what triggered him acting was remembering the covenant, not that he ever forgot it. But it triggered a remembrance when his people cried out to him. And there's a similar situation with us as his people. We can be honest. We can tell God what's going on. We can tell him why we think one thing. Maybe he thinks another. He might give us a response we don't like. But we can be honest with him. And that's what David was doing here. This made a great musical setting. So... Be blessed by this, Psalm 30. Thank you for listening today to the Act of Worship podcast. This is Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones. Should be 